Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Rick Steves Tours Festival of Europe. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the honor of serving as your moderator this evening as we navigate scenic Scandinavia with Rick and a very special guest. Now, without further ado, I would like to turn things over to our tour guide for this evening and many evenings to come, Rick Steves. Rick, over to you. Gabe, thank you very much, and thanks to each of you for tuning in tonight. We are going to go to Scandinavia. We've got a wonderful guest that's standing by in Oslo, where it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and we're ready to all get together and put our travel dreams into smooth and affordable reality. So this is day number five in our 22-day Europe Festival, and it's so fun to be able to every night enthuse about various corners of Europe. So. Thank you for joining and I'm going to jump right in to some slides right here and get us started in our January Europe Travel Fest. You know, we have 100 employees, 100 colleagues right here in Edmonds, half an hour north of Seattle. For 40 years, we've been taking groups from here around Europe. In last year, we had a good year. We took about 25,000 people on a thousand different tours, 40 different itineraries. And for literally decades, we've been welcoming our tour alums right here into Edmonds with a big festival. And we get together and each year we have five or six parties with a massing of the scrapbooks, a lot of people reuniting with their tour guides. We fly in a hundred guides from Europe and it's just a lot of fun. Well, we're selling tours right now and we're also just enthusing about how you can travel on your own. So of course, we've got tours to sell for 2023, but we are also putting on this festival for people who want to travel on their own. Equip yourself with a guidebook. You don't need to tap it quite this enthusiastically, but it doesn't hurt, I suppose. But remember, if you equip yourself with good information and expect yourself to travel smart, you can. So we're going to be focusing right now on Scandinavia. I want to remind you, we've got about 150 guides, most of them in Europe, and we are excited to share with you our love of Europe. Here you can see our schedule. Friday the 13th, we are going to Scandinavia with Paul Johansson, and he'll be with us in just a moment. Tomorrow, we're going to Switzerland, then we go to the Italian countryside, Every Monday, all through the month, we have a special edition of Monday Night Travel. Uh, this Monday, we'll be doing an irreverent history of Rick Steves' Europe tours, taking you way back to the early days, our Europe through the gutter days, and see how travel has changed in the last 30 or so years. Uh, a Monday after that, we're going to be doing ethical travels in a warming world, talking about the ethics of traveling and uh, climate change and other issues that we should be mindful of to be good citizens of the planet as we explore it. And then on the last evening, we'll have a grand finale. But you can see the different uh, events right here. They're all free. You're welcome to tune in. Just log on. Tell your friends. Every evening, we're going to get together 6 o'clock Seattle time, 9 p.m. on the East Coast. Each Monday for the next three Mondays, we'll be giving away a tour. It'll be your choice of any Rick Steves one week tour to London, to Paris, to Rome, or to Istanbul. And uh, we wanna remind you that a day after this event, everybody who, who's attending this event will get an email. And on there will be links of everything of interest in this presentation and a link to the tour uh, awards or the tour prize. Um, if you are uh, don't get that or if you'd like to sign up uh, 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 earlier or whatever, remember you can just go to ricksteves.com slash giveaway and find that application. There will be one opportunity for each traveler every week to have a drawing and see if that person wins on the following Monday. There are a few states and Canada where we're not allowed to offer this because of laws that guard people against aggressive gambling. And uh, we have to honor that. So we're sorry if you're in Canada or if you're in the states in our country that are not able to do this, but most people in the United States are welcome to join in the contest. Everybody is welcome to win a $100 discount on a seat if you sign up anytime this month. Just use the promo code when you go to ricksteves.com and you can enjoy getting on that tour at a little bit of a discount. 
Now, today we are specializing in Scandinavia, and I particularly like Scandinavia because it's my family's heritage. In fact, my very first trip to Europe, this is 1969 here, I was out there hunting for reindeer. You can see me 14 years old in Norway, getting to know the relatives and getting to know the beautiful countryside of Norway. Uh, this is uh, um, my son, Andy. He's one of our tour guides now, but this is about 30 years ago. And Andy is sitting in the middle of a Viking burial ground. And it's just something great, wherever your heritage is, to be able to go to the old country and connect with it. And, to, you know, and uh, so many of us have heritage in different corners of Europe. And it really is a delight to be able to check it out. This is our spaghetti map. It talks about, it shows all the different 40 itineraries we have around Europe. And the one we're featuring today is this one. This is the best of Scandinavia in 14 days. And if you look at this, we fly into Stockholm. Then we go down through Swedish countryside, stopping in Kalmar and to the capital of Denmark, Copenhagen, over to the island of Aero, and then back up the coast of Sweden to Oslo, into the mountains of Norway, into fjord country, finishing at Bergen. That's what we'll be looking at in the next hour. And uh, there's lots more to Scandinavia than that, of course. But if you've got 14 days for your vacation and you want to focus on Scandinavia, I would say this is the best, most exciting and rewarding 14 days that you could spend. I want to remind you, if you're not interested in a Rick Steves tour, that's no problem at all. Pick up a guidebook. I know a good guidebook for Scandinavia right here. This is designed to give you what you need to know to do Scandinavia on your own. Any of our itineraries make a lot of sense if you want to just grab those and be your own tour guide. When we look at a good uh, balanced itinerary of Scandinavia, it's got big cities, it's got cute small towns, it's got amazing scenery, especially on the west coast of Norway, and we've got great food. One thing that I think is very important is to remember we also have great guides that can give all of that food, all of that culture, all of that history meaning. I'd like to welcome right now, Paul Johansson. Paul. Hello, Rick. Hey, hey. how Thanks. are you? I'm good, but how are you? It's three o'clock in the morning in Oslo. What's going on? Oh, well, not much going on here. It's pretty dark uh, outside, but uh, then again, it's uh, it's dark for two thirds of the day here anyway, so <laughs> it's not a big difference. <laughs> That's right. This is the land nice of to be back on your show again. It's kind of like it's the land of the midnight sun in the summer, but it's also the land of the uh, midday uh, night in the middle of the winter. Yeah, it is. It is. Well, I'm so glad that you're with us. And pal, I've got some food here, and we're going to talk about that later. But I'll be munching on my open face sandwich, Norwegian style. What are you going I to be? I got some food as well. I got some lefse. Oh, lefse! Nice. Yeah, I'm going to snack on some lefse during the we'll, show. We'll snack on that, and I've got my uh, my akavit, and we'll also be uh, cracking open our good uh, fire water here in a little while. Good man. All right, and. Um, Right, actually, let's have some right now. I'm too thirsty. Um, I yeah. was going to drink uh, Sol. Do you, do you know what this is, Paul? Yeah, Solo. That's a very typical uh, orange pop. It's very popular in uh, in Norway. Norwegian Fanta. When I was yeah, a kid, it's good. it was all about... Better than Fanta. Yeah, better than Fanta. It was all about Solo and um, the long skinny wieners, uh, Pulsa. Pulsa, yeah. Oh, man. And I was one happy teenager with that. But now my uh, taste buds have matured, and we're going to have a little bit of. Explain to us what you're drinking there, Paul. So I have here an, an akavit. This is a, a Norwegian akavit. It's an aged uh, akavit, and this is something we typically drink, you know, for 17th of May, a national day, or for Christmas Eve, you know, whenever we want to celebrate something. Hey, we well, have we got some akavit. We got something to celebrate right now, and that's uh, an opportunity to travel. Uh, we're coming out of the pandemic. Uh, a lot of us are raring and ready to go, and uh, Scandinavia is a good option. I've got some akavit here, and uh, if I can understand my Danish, it says table akavit. Is that table? Tafel. Tafel, tafel. tafel akavit. Yeah, that's a, that's a Danish brand um, you have there. Sorry for the Danish, but... Um, <laughs> you know, in, in, Denmark, in Denmark, they always serve it... Um, like um, cold. In Norway, yeah. it's always room temperature. Okay, well, I'm going to have my Danish Akavit Norwegian style here, room temperature. And this is the water of life, literally, isn't it? Akavit. Akavit. Akavit, water of life. All right. And teach me, the Scandinavians make a big deal about scolding properly. Give me a little rundown here. 
Scrolling is very important. You know, there are books written on, on the topic. And uh, the first thing you do is just raise the glass to like eye level and then a uh, short glimpse into the eyes of the people around you. Okay. And then you say, skull. Skull. And you take a sip. Hmm. You raise the glass again and smile. And you're done. <laughs> <laughs> And if you're a lightweight American who just drinks the Makavit, you also grimace. Whoa, that is strong stuff. <laughs> yeah. Having it's said 40%. that, I like some more. It, nice. it says it's good for the digestion. Mm -hmm. hmm. It helps the fish find the stomach. Ah, there a lot you of go. sayings. <laughs> Skull, my friend. Thank you for joining us. Oh, that oh. is really good. All right. Hey, well, let's go, pal. And we're going to talk about some uh, dimensions of Scandinavia. And Scandinavia has a reputation for, um, I guess you could say boring food, but every time I go to Scandinavia, I enjoy eating in Scandinavia. Scandinavians know how to eat well. What do we have here? So what we see here is a typical Danish Christmas dinner. It's a pork roast in the middle there, and you have red cabbage, and then you have a caramelized uh, potato. So you are right, we, we eat very well in Scandinavia. And uh, this would be, this looks like a good Norwegian dish here. Yeah, there's some fish and some potatoes and a little bit of dill on the top. We like to have yeah. dill on, on seafood. And sandwiches are a big deal. I've got my open face sandwiches. Tell us a little bit about this, the smorbrod. Yeah, so here you have um, Danish open face sandwiches. I can, I can tell that just by looking at them. The Danes, they kind of have the fame for having the best uh, open face sandwiches or yeah. the smørbrød, as we call it. Smørbrød. If I understand my uh, Norwegian, that would be butter bread. Butter bread, yeah, butter, butter bread. bread. It's easy as that. But then so they just—it's. And I was asking you before we got on tonight. I said, Paul, I've got, I've got avocado, I've got herring, I've got hard-boiled eggs, I got some onions, and I got some peppers. Can I put that on my Vasa cracker and call it Norwegian? <laughs> <laughs> it's a. Let's call it a fusion. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very polite way to put it. I love when I'm traveling in Scandinavia, I get my, my little box of Vasa crackers and you always got some handy uh, food from the market and it makes for a nice, a delightful, um, um, characteristic, uh, hearty meal. Um, all right, let's uh, carry on with our slides. And I would like to know more about, oh, there's so much great food and great sweets. I think Scandinavians are really into desserts. Wouldn't you say that's a fair characteristic? I would say we have a sweet tooth uh, for sure. You know, every every meal is ended with a good uh, dessert. So uh, all kinds of cakes and puddings and uh, yeah, fruits. My, and, you know, my childhood memories are just dessert after dessert after dessert, three or four times a day. Everywhere we go, people would have desserts and uh, every everything seemed to end with caca. I thought that was kind of funny when I was a kid. <laughs> yes, caca is, is cake, basically. No, no, so give me like five or six uh, different cacas in Norway that you might have. Well, you know, krumkaka, kratzekaka, brødkaka, peppekaka. <laughs> there's there's a lot of caca. <laughs> Julekaka, Christmas cake. Julekaka, of there you course. Go. Hey, much better well, that's my favorite. Than, than kaka is a waffle with some uh, goat cheese, some brown cheese. Yeah, goat cheese, brown cheese. That's definitely one, one of my favorite uh, oh. snacks. Nice, nice. And this looks like a Swedish flag here. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, cinnamon buns for the fika, Swedish fika, which is um, coffee break with something sweet. That's a big deal in Sweden, isn't it? Uh, you just, in the middle of the morning, you have a coffee and a cinnamon roll or something. Not just in the morning, throughout the whole day, basically. It's, really? uh, it's almost like an institution in Sweden. Swedes, they Fika. sit down every two hours and they have a you know, <laughs> cinnamon bun and, and coffee. <laughs> Fika, F-I-K-A, you'll see fa uh, special yeah, deals. Huh? You go into the big department store and they've got Fika deals, you know. Um, yeah. But uh, I was going to ask you, we've looked at Danish and, you know, I was. Uh, we have the Danish open face sandwich. We have the Swedish Fika. Uh, your last name ends with S-E-N, indicating you would be Danish or Norwegian instead of Swedish, which would be S-O-N. Um, we know somebody who doesn't know Scandinavia, everybody's just blonde and blue-eyed and, and Scandinavian. Uh, but when you are in Scandinavia, there are some s s remarkable, distinct differences. How would you, in a nutshell, d d compare Danish, Swedish, and Norwegian societies and people? 
Well, you know, as you say, a lot of people, they, they kind of see us as, as one. But And of course, there is a lot of overlap between the countries, but there's also a lot of things that distinguish us. I mean, uh, we have each our, our separate language. Um, you know, we grow up with different cultural um, references. Uh, we have certain, you know, food types that you only find in, in you know, in Norway, Sweden or Denmark. So, so we are different in, um, in many ways, um, I would say. You have the different dialects, but you can understand each other's languages. Um, that that depends who you ask. <laughs> like for instance, I grew up with a lot of exposure to both Swedish and Danish, so I understand it very well. But but other people might have not, and they really struggle understanding, you know, the other languages. But they are fairly similar. Okay, similar. I want I want to get you in trouble. Don't be too politically correct here. Make a joke about Danes, Swedes, and Norwegians. There must be jokes between this family of Scandinavian brothers and sisters. <laughs> so Norwegians, we don't really, we don't have a lot of jokes about the Danes, but we have a lot of jokes about the Swedes, okay. uh, especially. Uh, let me tell you one, okay? I'm ready. So, um, do you know how to to sink a Swedish submarine? Um, pull out the plug. <laughs> you swim down and you knock on the door. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's great. That's great. Do you know how to sink it again? Uh, no. You swim down again. You open the door. Uh, you knock on the door. The Swede opens and he says, ah, you're not going to get me this time. <laughs> you dang And they have the same sure. jokes about us. <laughs> I'm sure they do. Oh, that's great. Well, um, you know, when I traveled in Scandinavia, because my grandparents came over on the boat from Norway, as soon as they got to Scandinavia, I go, oh, these are my people, you know. And then I was going from Denmark to Sweden, and I distinctly remember, pal, crossing the border uh, into Norway, and then I realized, oh, these are my people. I mean, I didn't realize the difference between Swedes and Norwegians. I, I don't know what it was, but I just felt at home mm. when I crossed into Norway. So there was a difference, and it's quite exciting when you travel to note those fine differences, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean... Uh... You can note it in the humor, for instance, you know, different sense of humor yeah. and, and yeah. just a different yeah. sense of, of talking and, and being. Um, yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we'll carry on here. Um, we've already talked about our school. And um, what are you doing here, pal? <laughs> well, I never miss out on the opportunity of, uh, of you know, having some aquavit and, and a school. Uh, I believe this is at one of the end of one of my trips and uh, I serve up some Aquavit for my whole group, and then uh, we make a skull. Hey, we are all, tour. as tour guides, Paul, we are all about creating experiences and memories, right? Yeah. And this, I'm sure, is a memory that your group remembered, and I bet they were glad to have you for their guide. Norway, Sweden, and Denmark all have kings and queens, royal families, don't they? But they're all constitutional monarchs. All constitutional uh, monarchs. This is the um, Danish queen we see here. And they're all just figureheads of, of states. Mm -hmm. They don't uh, have much power uh, at all. But they do play a role. And uh, they're an interesting part of the culture as you travel. And you can visit their palaces and see the changing of the guard and all of that pageantry. Yeah. I like this shot because it talks <laughs> about the, the fun-loving yet pragmatic Scandinavians. What are we seeing here? Here we are seeing a high school celebration so basically they celebrate that they are done with with high school uh, and those are huge celebrations that we have in all the three scandinavian countries now if and, this, um, if, if, a, if a high school graduation is anything like it is in the united states these kids graduate and they're gonna have a big party and that involves some drinking right and it's, and it's not just one party. It goes on for weeks. <laughs> it's a long party. <laughs> and, and you see that. And I was fascinated by the pragmatic approach that Danish parents have to this. The kids are going to get drunk as they do in the United States. And it's dangerous and it, it disturbs parents, but kids are going to do it. I think, yeah. I think in the United States, we say, promise me you won't drink and drive, you know, and, and kids promise they won't drink and drive. And then they drink and drive and kids get in accidents and people die. In Scandinavia, yeah. my understanding is the parents say, okay, kids, we're going to hire the truck drivers and we're going to host the parties. And you guys can go from house to house and the parents will serve you your drinks and you won't be driving because you've got this decorated truck that takes you from party to party and you'll have a fun and safe time because That's we want you to not get in an accident. That's a, that to me is a distinctly Scandinavian sort of pragmatism and I just love it. It is. And, you know, 
finishing high school here is, is such a big event because when you finish high school, you're kind of expected to become independent, to, mm -hmm. you know, move out of your parents' home and move to the city, go to university and sort of manage life um, on your own. That's why it's such a big, a big celebration uh, here. Oh, yeah. Well, nowadays, when Americans finish school, they move back home and uh, just live downstairs in their mom and dad's place. <laughs> All right. So we've got a chance to carry on now. We're going to go to Stockholm. And if I, if I had to live anywhere in Europe, Stockholm is one place I might live. It's an amazing city uh, with a beautiful, beautiful harbor front, beautiful architecture, and an old town. This is the Gamlastan. Tell us about the Gamlastan. Yeah, so I would say uh, out of the three Scandinavian capitals, you know, Stockholm, they have uh, the best preserved old town, Gamlastan, yeah. uh, which sits on an island, um, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, and this is a must see when you get to um, to Stockholm. It's where you you know you find the buildings dating back to medieval ages. It's where you find the royal palace, um, several churches, um, and so on. Um, mm -hmm. It's a really interesting place of uh, of Stockholm. And jazz clubs in the evening. Scandinavians love their jazz. Ah, I just love the squares in the old part of Stockholm. In any of the capitals, I can think of Oslo, Copenhagen. In Stockholm right now, and they've all got memorable opportunities to see the changing of the guard at the Royal Palace. And it's fun to just to be out on the streets and see the kids. Uh, here we have um, a, a lot of reminder that in Scandinavia, it's quite a progressive society. You have maternity leave and paternity leave, right? It's it's a paid vacation, paid time off to be parents when you have a new baby, but it's for the mom and for the dad, and it's use it or lose it. Yeah, we have a, we call it parental uh, leave. So, uh, so you know, Sweden actually changed it from maternity leave to parental leave back in the early 1970s. So wow. yeah. you know, they were very progressive. And uh, for instance, in Norway, it's uh, 12 months, and it's typically shared. So it's six months for each uh, parent, and it, it's fully paid uh, as well. And uh, taxpayers are okay with that. Yeah, they are. I mean, you pay into the system, but you also receive it back whenever you get a kid. So there you go. Yeah. And uh, it's not uncommon in the early afternoon to go to a coffee shop and see a traffic jam of baby strollers and the dads, they're all getting together. Yeah. And and often the dads are sitting on the inside and the strollers are parked on the outside. Yeah, <laughs> just park the kids outside. I've yeah. noticed that in Scandinavia, you just park your kid outside and you run in and do your shopping and everybody takes care of everybody. It's just amazing. One of the great sites in all of Scandinavia is the Vasa. This is the, yeah. the ultimate state of the art worship in its day and leave it to the Swedes. They, on its maiden voyage, what I understand everybody ran to one side and waved and it was a little top heavy because of all the cannon and it just tipped over and it sank to the bottom of the harbor and it stayed there for 300 years until it was excavated in modern times today giving us an intimate look at you know maritime uh, warfare and state-of-the-art worship from what 350 years ago yeah from this ship was built in the early um, 1600s and uh didn't sail very far before um, <laughs> too much wind came and it started to tilt over slowly, 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 and it sank. Oh, so. Fascinating it's museum today, I'll tell you. And then right next to that museum, you can step into Skansen. The Scandinavians, I think, were leaders in protecting their heritage by before they were bulldozed and built over by modern construction, grabbing historic buildings from every corner of the country and reassembling them in a park in the capital city. So whether you're in Copenhagen or in Oslo or in Stockholm or Finland, you can see these open air folk museums more than just traditional buildings. Uh, you've got musicians and artisans. It's quite an experience, isn't it, uh, for a visitor, pal? Yeah, it is. I mean, um, this one in, in Stockholm, I, I, of, I often describe it as kind of like a miniature Sweden. Yeah. You, know, you go in there and you get a little glimpse of, uh, you know, what Sweden looked like in the, in the countryside back in, in the days. You can walk People around the whole... Up. You can walk around the whole country without leaving that park. If you're not going to have time to go up to the north and see Lapland, you can see it right there. Another thing about Scandinavian capitals that I find very striking is the importance of the city hall compared to the church on the main square. Scandinavia, very humanistic, very progressive, very civic minded. 
And the, to me, the, the city halls in Copenhagen, Stockholm and Oslo, they feel almost like churches when you step inside and we can tour them on our tours. And I would imagine that's a highlight for a lot of, of our visitors. Yeah, you know, when you when you travel around to capitals in Europe, you don't really think of uh, the city hall as a place you, you need to go. But in Scandinavia, the city halls in our capitals are, are must-sees, they're highlights. It's like stepping into the nave of a church and celebrated an, above what would be the altar, uh, where you find a pulp, uh, a lectern where people can talk who are public servants. Uh, you've got a mural that celebrates the heritage of that country or heroic citizens who helped make that country great. And you find that in each of the capitals. So from Stockholm, we head out and everybody on the tour gets one of the Scandinavia guidebooks so that uh, the, the tour guides can have something to rely on. You've got maps, you've got information on where to eat for meals that are not included. Uh, you've got um, uh, sites that you can see when you are uh, with your free time. You've got language lessons and everything in that guidebook. And that I would imagine is a handy tool for you as a guide when you're running around Scandinavia for two weeks. It really is. And um, when I lead a tour, I always use the book a lot on the bus uh, as well, doing mm. language lessons and you know map orientations uh, and so on. And uh, when you're on the bus, it's just a great, you know, you have some downtime and it's just a great, yeah. great uh, way to read up on Scandinavia. And, you know, sometimes you got the eager beaver students that are going to do all the reading and all the extra stuff and other people who are just on vacation and they'll take whatever comes their way, which is yeah. great. And that's why I have the guidebook lets people do it on their own temple, temple, tempo. So we're heading south from Stockholm. And what are we going to see? So when we head south from Stockholm, we stop uh, by a very cute little village. This one is called Söderköping. We actually have lunch in this uh, in this place. Cute little uh, little place. Söder shipping. Söder shipping. Here's a typical Swedish farm. You can see that from the from the red paint, which is so typical in uh, in Sweden. You see all all over. And here we're down in Kalmar. You can see the the Kalmar Castle there, the best preserved Renaissance castle that we have in uh, in Sweden. Uh, wow. A lot of history happened in Kalmar. This is where the Kalmar Union took place, which was a union between uh, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. So it's a great, oh. you know, great place to a, learn about the history. And it's a, there's a very interesting maritime and military history there, uh, reminding people how strategic there were um, fortresses in Scandinavia that would protect the capital. Of course, Scandinavia needs to trade together. I'm so impressed by this massive uh, bridge that was built that essentially connects Copenhagen in Denmark with Malmo, a big city in Sweden, creating what, uh, when you include that bridge, Malmo and Copenhagen together are like the biggest economic uh, zone in Scandinavia, I believe. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's become, I mean, it used to be just ferries going across there. Mm. And, but after they built the bridge, it's, it's become a very vibrant um, area. And a lot of people live on the Swedish side, but then they go work on, on the Danish side. So it's, you know, it's a lot of cooperation. Yeah. And then you get to Copenhagen and it's got its wonderful harbor, Nee Haven, and uh, a chance for our guides to, to wander around the capital and, and get a little dose of Danish history and Danish culture and Danish architecture, Danish royal pageantry. I just love the changing of the guard in all of these countries. And of course, Hans Christian Andersen. When we are there with our groups, we make friends with the modern day Hans Christian Andersen. Do you know Richard Carpen, Paul? Oh yeah, I know him very well. He knew very well. He's a great storyteller and, you know, um, sort of a, a living uh, as Christian Andersen in, uh, in Copenhagen. He plays the role. He's an American expat that for, I've known him for 25 years, I believe. And uh, he's just been bringing to life the heritage of Hans Christian Andersen and through that role playing, also being a great tour guide in Copenhagen. You know, you could do um, a tour of every place you go on the tour. But I'm glad that we have local guides that we book and, and um, employ that give us another voice and another perspective. How is that for you? Yeah, I think that's that's really important that we have, you know, local people on each on each spot that can sort of give their insight into uh, the culture and, and where they live and, you know, give an overview of the history. But at the same time, uh, focus on, on contemporary issues um, as well. Yeah. 
Yeah. In fact, I've talked with Richard about the whole ethic in Denmark of, you know, um, people living in close quarters and people paying high taxes, but having high expectations out of their government. And he always reminds me that when somebody pays higher taxes, it doesn't mean they're paying more because there's just things that are provided collectively to the to the community, like education, uh, you know, like medicine and like a, a, a really a dignified retirement for all people who have contributed to that through the, the course of their work life. Um, how would you sum up the ethic about um, big government versus little government and willingness to pay taxes, but high expectations of the government and, and uh, trust in institutions, which I think is, is part of the, the magic mix of Scandinavian society, trust in institutions. Mm. Yeah, there's a, there's a very high trust in institutions and in politicians um, as well. And, and you know, this is a system that we're all a part of. You know, we're all part of, the, of, of our welfare system, so to say. Um, we pay into it. And, you know, the day when we pay our taxes might not be the happiest day of the, of the year. But we know that we also get a lot back from, from the system and whenever we, uh, we need it. So... Uh, most Scandinavians are quite fine, you know, paying fairly high taxes. And, you know, Denmark several times have been, you know, um, said that they're the happiest people in the world. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they're also the people that pay the most taxes in the world. So uh, it's interesting. Yeah. But they have trust in their governments. They have trust in their people have a, a, an ethic of, you know, we're, we're all in this together. Um, and I think a lot of people who don't like taxes if you if you honestly measured your taxes, your education, and your health care all together, you might find you'd pay less in Scandinavia than you pay in the United States. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I personally I pay around thirty five percent tax uh -huh. income tax. That's uh -huh. that's the only tax I pay, and and that covers you know my my health coverage. I had free education and so on, and I some nice. retirement money to look forward to. So oh, I'm, I'm not complaining. Oh, that's great. Well, it's fun to be exposed to that. And it's fun to share ideas in our travels. Um, the Little Mermaid could swim anywhere, but she chooses to live right there in Copenhagen. Yeah, yeah she's sitting there on the rock. She's always been there. She never goes anywhere. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and there's a wonderful modern sense of design when you're in Scandinavia. This is a beautiful a new concert hall in Copenhagen. Yeah, uh, that's the new opera house in uh, Copenhagen, yeah. down by the canal. Yeah. Wow. Well, we're going to see Oslo's Opera House a little while later. What do you like better, Oslo's or Copenhagen's? That's, uh, <laughs> that's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what's going on. Here we have a modern uh, uh, harbor front in Copenhagen with sort of a, a summertime beach. Everybody's there on the promenade just enjoying the sun. Scandinavians are great sun worshipers. And while there's a lot of conformity in Scandinavia and everybody walking together, there's also a, a free spiritedness. And that you see at the hippie squatter community of Christiania. Tell us, uh, Paul, about Christiania in Copenhagen. Yeah, Christiania or, or the free town, as it's, it's called. And um, it started back in the, in the 70s, early 70s, when sort of hippies, they went into this area and, and became, you know, squatters. And um, it was, it was an like unused, it was an unused uh, Paul, it was an unused military barracks, wasn't it? And they just said, yeah, it was. Heck, let's just go in here and make it our town. Yeah. And, and today it's a very, you know, it's a very vibrant and, and a thriving community. And, and you have all kinds of people um, living in there. And it's a, it's a very interesting go, place to go, I think, when you visit um, Copenhagen. I think a lot of people there pride themselves in never having purchased anything from a corporation. It's always a handmade and a trading used things economy. People who want to build this are a little bit um, frustrated by this because this sits on great land now and it could be developed and somebody could make a lot of money. But in Christiania, I love the, the attitude. I mean, if I can read my Danish here, isn't it something like uh, only dead fish go with the stream? Yeah, correct. Only dead fish go with the flow. They like to swim where they want to swim, not where everybody tells them to swim. Live life artistically, says on the top. Oh, I like that. Live life artistically. Yeah. Only dead fish float with the stream. L read that to me, translating literally. There's like 10 words there. What does it say? So, so on the top, it says, I'll, I'll say it in Danish. Live, live, kunstnerisk. 
Um, and on the on the bottom it says Kunde Fisk Flimeströmen. And if you translated it Paul, literally word for word into English, what would it be? So live life artistically and then kun only döde dead fisk fish flöde which is float me it's with and strömen is the stream i river. love it you know there's a good example of how we can fake it on the language in so many ways i mean if you just are bold and be willing to take a guess you can look at that poster and un almost understand what it's telling us Many more people go to Tivoli than almost any place in Copenhagen. This is the Disneyland for the Danes. Quite an elegant uh, uh, amusement park. You can go in the evening or you can go in the day. It's a great place with kids with all the rides and a great place to uh, just just kind of make the scene. It's it's. Um, do do you find most of your groups like to go to Tivoli? Yeah, I do. Most of them of them go. I always enjoy going there in the evening when you have you know it's a bit dark and you have all the lights on and so on it's it's a really enjoyable uh, place and it's right there across the street from the train station as central as you can be and if you don't have enough money after you pay the admission to get into tivoli you can buy a pulsa for the cheapest pulsa. dinner in town yeah <laughs> danish hot dog not to be missed the dead man's finger <laughs> <laughs> hey when you leave copenhagen you go to a place called roskelde famous for two things where the kings and queens were uh, what married and buried and uh the vikings tell us about roskilde yeah so in, in roskilde you find the roskilde cathedral which is uh, the biggest burial site in the world for um for for monarchs uh, mm -hmm. only the danish monarchs and then you also find the viking ship uh, museum there with yeah. some um, ships that they found out in uh, in the roskilde fjord about uh, 70 years ago and and that's a really interesting museum because not only do you see the old ships and learn about um, the vikings and, and the construction of the ships but they also have a shipyard at the museum so you know you can go and you can also see how the ships are built amazing and it's just a wonderful wonderful user-friendly inviting museum where uh it it rivals anything in scandinavia for viking heritage and from the we we take the bus to the south end of denmark hop on a ferry and you know i've spent so many years researching my guidebooks and leading tours in scandinavia and paul i just love our itinerary because it has big cities and small towns and beautiful countryside it's a good mix isn't it for two weeks yeah, you know, it, it's something about when you've been in the big cities for a while, you maybe you want to go out in the countryside and see some some smaller places. And, and then we go to Ero, the Ero Island. Ero. And there's the there's a beautiful word in uh, Denmark, hygli. I suppose you got the same word in Norwegian, but it really characterizes Danish culture to me right quite well. Hygli means like uh, cozy and quaint. Yeah, cozy. Yeah, having a cozy time. Hygli. It's very, it's very uh, widespread in Denmark. Yeah, so little tiny hoogly cabins in a hoogly town on a hoogly island with hoogly <laughs> friends having hoogly food. <laughs> Look at that. With the landing of every ferry, just like washing in with the surf, a whole bunch of new locals and visitors coming up the cobbled main street of Aeroscoping, the main town in that island. Wonderful locals, wonderful heritage, great food, colorful architecture. I characterize it as a ship in a bottle town. It's just, yeah. it's almost as tidy as a ship in a bottle. And there's even a museum in the town. Have you been into Bottle Peter Museum? Oh yeah, many, many times. That's oh. an amazing museum there. Ship in a bottle uh, museum. Hundreds of small, you know, bottles with, with ships in them. Uh, <laughs> very, very fascinating uh, place. And then I would love to be a tour guide on Aero with an afternoon to bike around the island. Tell us what we can do with a bicycle on the island of Aero. So um, the island is like fairly flat and there's a lot of bike paths so you can rent bikes and then you can go for a, for a bike trip. And that is something that I always do when I get to, uh, to Ere. I love it. I absolutely love it. And you get this wonderful sort of uh, just a, a beautiful rural sense. You know, you can uh, see the, the, the horses and the cows and, uh, and the people in the farm communities and the smiles and things like you mentioned are for sale in the honors system. If, you know, they got some strawberries, they'll put it out with a bunch of little baskets and you pay what, uh, what you like or what, what they ask you. And it's all in the honors system. It's just a beautiful thing. Now we are going, and I want to stop sharing the screen because this is very important. We're going to the homeland of you and me, Norway. 
Yeah, now, now comes the best part. Now comes the best part. Norway <laughs> is a big country with a small population. People don't realize how tall it is. I looked on the map once and I figured this out. Have you ever thought about this, Paul? If you went from Oslo to the northern end of Norway, North Cape, and if you could swing that distance down, it would be as far as Oslo to Rome in Italy. That's right. And between Oslo and Rome, you've got about 200 million people, I would imagine. Between Oslo and North Cape, how many people would you find? Uh, you find about 5 million people, just over <laughs> 5 million people. So, 5 million uh, people. It's yeah, one of the less, uh, you know, uh, densely populated countries in, in Europe. Population sparsity is not a bad thing these days, is it? No. Nope. Here you go. So what are we looking at? So here we're in Oslo, we're at the harbor front, and you see that building with the two towers. That is the Oslo City Hall, which is by far one of my favorite buildings in, uh, in Oslo. As we talked about, each Scandinavian capital has a wonderful city hall, and these are like a cultural pilgrimage. People come here for their marriage photographs. People come here. Uh, I sat at this table with my cousin in Norway when yeah. I was uh, bringing groups to us in Scandinavia just to talk to a local person, like people get to talk to you on the whole trip. Those are the days before we had good Scandinavian guides and Americans like me were trying to do a good job, but now we have guides like you. I just but love, for instance, this mural here. My, my uncle has taken me on a stroll through this mural and, and just in a slow walk, narrated the whole story. Could, can you do that right now for us, Paul, what we're seeing here? So this mural here, which is a fresco, it's called the Occupation Freeze. And it basically starts on the left and it goes to the right. And it depicts scenes from uh, the Nazi occupation of Norway during Second World War. Um, from the early days in 1940 and up until you know, our liberation in, in 1945. And uh, well, I think especially considering what's going on in, in Ukraine these days, you know, this, mm. this wall has you know, more relevance than it's had in, in a long time. I just got goosebumps when you said that. It is so parallel, isn't it? You yeah. just had a stronger, bigger nation thinking they could just come in and take you and Norway, Norway valiantly, valiantly kept their, their spirit alive. The king had to leave the country, but he kept the country rallying together. And this tells the whole story of the underground and the Nazis and the spirit of Norway. And then the happy day in 1945, when the king went back to Oslo and Norway had regained its freedom. Yeah. Hey, Rick, could you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. So, so in the city hall, that's where uh, you do civil weddings. And this is the wedding room. Oh. And it's called, it's called the Munch room because that's a painting by a Norwegian painter, Edward Munch, in the back. Yeah. And I'm going to share that I'm going to get married in that room in three weeks. Paul, that's great news. <laughs> yeah. What's your wife's name? Gabrielle. Gabrielle. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. How long so, did you know? Uh, how, did, how did you meet her? Where is she from? Oh, so she's actually from from Canada, from Edmonton. You know, Edmonton, yeah. <laughs> My Nor so do you I know met her that seven years ago, and um, yeah, now it's it's about time to get married. So that's uh, going to happen in a few weeks from now. Edmonton is full of amazing women. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> my funny. grandparents, my grandparents left Norway a hundred years ago, and they homesteaded in Edmonton in Alberta. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, oh. and. Uh, I would imagine, I don't know what it's like now, but I imagine back then the only reason you would homestead in Edmonton was for free land. They were homesteading, yeah. they got free land. Those winters are cold, really, so really cold. Those winters make Oslo look like uh, the, the San Tropez. Yeah, almost. Hey, you're going to be in that room and you're going to get married. Congratulations, pal. That is Thank really, you. really exciting. And I'm glad that you, uh, you mentioned that as uh, I just zipped right by it. All right. Okay. Hey, here's this uh, beautiful um, opera house in Oslo, and it's got an amazing rooftop. I mean, that's the rooftop, but I've been there for concerts when the band is on a barge out in the bay. Everybody gathers there to enjoy the music. Oslo must be very, very proud and thankful for this beautiful, uh, iconic building to be a, a center of their musical and, and high culture. Yeah, I mean, Oslo has had a huge facelift the last uh, 20 years, and it, it started with, with the Opera House, where, I mean, not everybody that visits Oslo goes to an opera, but what they for sure is, do is to go up on the roof of the opera. You can walk up on the 
on the very roof as you see as you see there and it's become one of the main attractions in uh, in Oslo to just go up there and and see the oh. views of the fjord and and That's it's really great. a spectacular building you know this reminds me um I should mention cruising makes a lot if you like to cruise the North European cruises I think are wonderful and um they stop just a couple of blocks from this building in Oslo uh, they stop uh, in Copenhagen, of course, and they stop in uh, Stockholm, they stop in Helsinki, they stop in Tallinn and Estonia, and they stop over in Bergen. Uh, it's, it's quite an amazing uh, corner of Europe from a cruise accessibility point of view. Every great city is also a great port. Uh, here we have a, a, a good example of the uh, futuristic architecture inside this building. and. Just to think that a society of 5 million people can build something like this and, and keep it vital is quite impressive, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it is. It's, you know, big glass windows, a lot of light coming in, you know, beautiful. Did you, did you spend uh, a lot of your North, did you spend a lot of your North Sea oil on that? Or I, I understand in Norway, you don't want to just blow your North Sea oil money. You've got it squirreled away for a rainy day. Well, most, yeah, most of our um, profits from the from the oil goes into a big fund. So we only use about two two to three percent of the revenue um, uh -huh. every year over the state budget, and then the rest is saved up for future generations. And um, yeah. uh, it's a uh, huge amount of money. You Norwegians, I, I just think that you really it must be nice to have a well educated electorate that has a a, a sense of civic wellness. I mean, what's good for all is good for me, not the vice versa in Scandinavia. And it seems to work well for you. Yeah, I think this like um, solidaric thinking is, is yeah. very deep rooted in yeah. uh, in Scandinavia. I think so. And um, and you've certainly earned your independence. That's for sure. This is the Akershus Fortress right there in Oslo and outside of town behind or not outside of town behind the palace one of my favorite places in all of Europe from an art and a culture point of view uh Vigeland uh, sculpture gardens Frogner Park um what do you know what do you what do you think about Gustav Vigeland oh I love Gustav Vigeland I love this park I've been there hundreds of times and uh, I never tire it's um it's such a, a touching thing to be there because it's such a you know big tribute to oh. uh, to humanity um, that's what Vigeland wanted with with this park, and um, and it's a unique park in in Scandinavia, and if not in in all of Europe, I would say. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, but a hundred years ago, the, the royal family in in Oslo or the parliament, I suppose, uh, recognized the talent of this Norwegian artist Gustav uh, or Vigeland, and um, they told him essentially. Hey, if you will dedicate the rest of your life to just creating great art for our for our people, we'll set you up with a great studio and a marvelous park to show off your art. And Vigeland said, that sounds good to me. And he spent the rest of, rest of his artistic life creating this amazing park. And to this day, we're all enjoying it because of that progressive civic-minded government and a, a patriotic um, uh, enthusiast for the Norwegian culture, who was a great artist. Yeah, I mean, he he spent over twenty years working on this as park, and um, Oslo municipality basically basically gave him everything he needed, um, and then the deal was that everything he made would belong to the city. Wow, it's so cool! It's so beautiful. In fact, yeah. there is a great sculpture garden in every Scandinavian capital, including Iceland, and I think it's important for us to remember there are twentieth century artists that really are remarkable in Scandinavia. A long heritage we can see in the museums and uh, out across the harbor is Big Doy. And uh, I understand the, the Great Viking Museum is closed for a little while. Yeah, it's going to be closed until 2025, 20, 26. They're um, expanding the museum, making it bigger and making it nicer. And uh, that, takes a, that takes a while because uh, these ships, you know, they're over a thousand years old. Uh, yeah. They can't be moved around very easily. So it's a very, very tedious um, process. But I suppose we can still go out to Big Doy. It's just a 15 minute uh, cruise from down from the city hall there in the harbor front. And you can oh, see yeah. the, you can see the Fram, which is the uh, Arctic exploration vessel. You can see the Kontiki. Uh, you can see uh, the Ra. There's a lot of interesting maritime history to enjoy. Plus, you've got the Open Air Folk Museum right there in Oslo, the Big Doy Open Air Folk Museum, which is a lot like Skansen that we saw in uh, in Sweden, in Stockholm. Mm. 
What's going yeah, on here? It's, it's uh, I mean, very accessible. You just sip across the harbor with the ferry, or you can take a bus out there. And we call it the the museum island, actually, because yeah. there's so many so many museums out there. So it is the museum we, island with a beautiful view of the city. Nearby yeah. is the famous ski jump, Homan Colon. It's been mm -hmm. renovated since this shot, but boy. I grew up uh, enjoying uh, sports on TV, and they said the, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat, and the agony of defeat was a ski jumper crashing. And um, every time I go up Holman Colton, I think of those ski jumpers ripping down that ski jump. Wow. And then we head off on our tours into the countryside of Norway, going up good Bronsdalen Valley. Uh, there's a, we go by um, uh, Lillehammer, where the Olympics were, and there's an open-air folk museum called Maihaugen, and mm -hmm. uh, I understand that's where our group stop is the Open Air Folk Museum in Maihaugen on the way to the high country, Jotunheim. What does Jotunheim mean, literally? Yeah, Jotunheim means the home of the giants, or the home of the trolls. Wow. And you can understand when you get there how this seems like it must have been the home of the giants. And this, are, this is the spine of Norway. Uh, and then from these rugged peaks, we go down to fjord country on the west. And I am so thankful, pal, that our groups get to stay in an elegant countryside mansion of a hotel. Tell us about this hotel that our groups get to stay in while I have another glass of my Akavit. <laughs> yeah, this hotel, this particular hotel is a real gem. You know, it's um, a place that's been family owned for generations. And you have, you know, thick uh, timber walls and there's a lot of nice decoration from the Norwegian countryside. There are paintings in there that might as well could be hanging in, in the National Museum down in Oslo. So it's a very impressive place. You know, I'm coming to Oslo. I'm going to come to Scandinavia this spring or no, this summer um, to update my guidebook on, on Scandinavia. I was all set when COVID hit. I had my plane ticket, my reservations and everything. I think I'd actually booked a couple of days with you in Oslo. And then with COVID, we had to put everything on hold. But now we're back in the saddle and I'll be coming to update the book and I can hardly wait to get out there and check out these amazing slices of nature. Look at the fjord country here. We're coming in to the west of Norway. This is my favorite painting in, in Norway because it really takes me right back to the, the roots of Norwegian culture and the, the closeness that people have with, with their, their neighbors and with nature. Tell us what we're looking at here, Paul. So this is actually in the Hardanger Fjord. Uh, it's a marriage. So they're heading to uh, a church. And you can, you can see the church in the back there, in the far back. Um, and those are one of those old, you know, wooden stave churches that we also see yeah. on, uh, on the trip. Yeah. Oh, how, what, what time period would you guess this is? Oh, this is definitely in the 1800s. So yeah. uh, during the, our national romantic um, era, that's ah. uh, when we wanted to, you know, create our own sort of national identity, you know, break away from the Danes and the Swedes that's and, right. the, and, put, and portray the, Danes, the Norwegian countryside. Those darn Danes and Swedes, they always thought Norway could just be their little, little brother and part of their country. But uh, the Norwegians kept strong. And in the 1800s, Norway asserted itself and uh, had their own independence, their own constitution. And back then, I believe the capital of Norway was uh, way over in the west coast, wasn't it, Bergen? Yeah, if you go back to the, the 1200s, then the capital uh, was, uh, was Bergen. But Oslo was named Christiania after a Danish king all the way up until 1925 when we took the old Oslo name uh, back. So How finally, we, finally we are free from the Danes and the Swedes. You didn't have, you had, a, you had a, a capital city named after the Danish queen. That is something. Here's one of those Stav churches you were talking about. These are like a, like 800 years old or something, aren't they? Oh yeah, they they can date back to 11th uh, century, and um, these were churches that were kind of like built in that in the crossroads, you know, between paganism and and Christianity. That's why you can see the the dragon heads uh, on top of it. Yeah, um, yeah, very fascinating structures. And then uh, with our groups, we get a nice cruise on the most beautiful part of the uh, fjords. We go um, what up from uh, Sonja Fjord and through Narrow Fjord, right? Yeah, we do Sogne Fjord, and then we do the Nere Fjord, which is uh, on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Beautiful little villages, some of them totally isolated, only accessible by boat. And we're out there on the deck enjoying the view, that's for sure. 
And if you're going on your own, remember, Paul and I have been talking about our tours. We're so enthusiastic about our tours, but you can do this on your own. You equip yourself with a guidebook, wonderful public transit. You can be driving. This is one of our tour buses. Uh, I love, as a tour guide, by the way, to stop the bus, let people get out and walk for 15 minutes, just down the downhill, just to feel the breeze and enjoy the view and get out and have some fresh air. If you're driving, you encounter a very long tunnel. Tell us about this tunnel. Yeah, this is the, the Lardals Tunnel, and it's uh, the longest car tunnel in the world. And it's it's uh, it has these like color lights every now and then, four yeah. places inside the tunnel to sort of break up the monotony when you drive through it. So if you're dreaming, you have nice colors or no, so you don't fall asleep, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you can make a stop. You can make a photo stop inside the tunnel, basically. How many kilometers is that tunnel? Um, I believe it's it's in miles. It's about 15 miles. 15 miles. That's yeah. just amazing. And all because Norway is lacing together its communities through the fjord country. Uh, if you're on your own without a tour bus or without a car, you can take one of the most scenic train rides in all of Europe from Oslo to Bergen. And you stop uh, up at the top and you catch a little cogwheel train down to Flam. And it's a touristic ride, so it's all about scenery. You stop at a great uh, waterfall, and then you get to Bergen. And that's the, the grand finale of our tour. And this is the sister city of Seattle. Uh, Bergen is the historic and cultural capital of, Os of, of Norway in so many ways. And you can ride the funicular up to a beautiful viewpoint to check out the city. And uh, you've got, on, on festival days, we've got the, the tall ships coming in. And uh, when you look at those wooden facades there, in Bergen, what do you think of, Paul? Oh, I think about the Hanseatic League, the yeah. old German trade organization that were trading, you know, dried the codfish for hundreds of years. So Bergen was part of the Hanseatic League, and Bergen oh, yeah. was, and the Germans cared about Bergen because of the cod. And before refrigeration, you could salt up some cod, and uh, that meant survival through the winter. And uh, the Germans were there. It was a German trading town. And it was basically connecting the cod of the Nordic region with the hungry uh, people of the of the south. And to this day, we can see cod dried and hanging in the market. Uh, oh, great oh. seafood, isn't that? Isn't that a great? Doesn't that make you want to have dinner? Oh, yeah. You can have a really Viking feast there in Bergen <laughs> at the fish market. You know, you have shrimp and you have king crab and mussels. And yeah, you find everything at the fish you market. Had you had the greatest reaction as soon as I showed that photograph. I you just your whole body just got excited. <laughs> <laughs> it's so oh, good. Oh, baby! Here's Edvar Grieg, and uh, this is the great Norwegian composer. You can go out to Trollhagen, where he was inspired. He had his little little cabin on the fjord, and, and you can actually see the the bench he sat on, and the keyboard, and the piano he composed at. And you look out the window, and you see the fjord that inspired him. Oh, when I was a little kid. I would play Edvar Grieg and my Norwegian relatives were just over the moon to see their American uh, nephew playing music by the great Edvar Grieg. Oh my goodness. So much fun to be had in, in, in Scandinavia. So great to have a big bus, isn't it, Paul? It is, you know, buses are always comfortable and, um, and great drivers um, as well. Friendly drivers. That's an important part of the tour, I think. Yeah. You know, the, the driver always becomes a part of the of the tour and the group, and I, I like that. I think that's very important. It's something I'm proud of with our tour company is the drivers are part of the family. I'm also proud of our guides. You're you're a wonderful guide, and and so are the rest of our team from Scandinavia. Here we see a lot of our guides that do our tours through Norway. I'm just so thankful for the work that you guys do. And uh, what what's going on here with this photograph? Who wants pickled herring? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants pickled herring? I surrender to the charms of Scandinavia. All right. Well, we just have one itinerary for Scandinavia, and it's the best of Scandinavia in 14 days. Uh, Paul, can you talk us through this itinerary just to remind us what we would do or what a traveler could do if they were on their own, starting in Stockholm and finishing in Bergen? Give us a, a quick rundown on, on, on this itinerary, please. Yeah, so you can start in, in Stockholm, capital of Sweden, spend two nights there, then travel down the east coast of Sweden, stop by some cute little villages, and you'll end up in Kalmar, where you can visit the, the Kalmar Castle, best preserved Renaissance castle in, uh, in Sweden. From Kalmar, you can drive um, over the Öresund Strait, over the bridge to Copenhagen, spend a couple of nights in, in Copenhagen, 
Um, then if you had enough of the big city, you head down to Eru, which is a little fairy tale uh, island that we talked about. Go back Eru, in, Eru, two different letters. Look at that. The A is connected with the yeah. E and the O with a cross through it. Eru. Eru. Gotcha. Eru. Eru. <laughs> it's a hard Thank one. You. <laughs> Spend some time in, in Eru and then you go back to Copenhagen and continue up the west coast of um, Sweden. Make a stop in Varberg, which is uh, sort of a beach uh, town. And then you will come to the best part of the trip, which will be Norway and Oslo. See some highlights of Oslo, spend two nights and drive up into the mountains. I always think it's nice to spend a night up in the mountains as well. Oh, yeah. And do a fjord cruise the next day and then end your trip in uh, Bergen. Wow. Thank you for that. I want to remind our our visitors, our, our viewers right now, every year we take about 30,000 people around Europe, God willing. And here you see our... Um, our, our general sort of sales pattern, when we look at our tour program, uh, this is the tour sales for 2017, 18, 19, no COVID, 22 and 23. Uh, the, the red line on the far right is 23, that's this year's sales so far. But you can see how there's two sales spikes in May and June, and then it tails off in July and August. And then September, where we have more than 100 buses on the road at the same time, October is pretty popular, and then on into December. Scandinavia is the exception. Uh, we Most of our Scandinavian tours would be in the summer. We travel right through the summer in Scandinavia uh, because it's uh, great to be in Scandinavia in the summer. Here you see a pie chart that breaks out our sales of the 25 or 30,000 people we take to Europe every year. This is how it breaks out. And Scandinavia would be a very tiny slice of that considering all of the other more mainstream destinations. Um, I wanna just um, take a moment right now and remind you that you can go to um, our website at ricksteves.com and I'll take you there right now. It's simply my name.com, ricksteves.com. And this is a world of free information for anybody planning a trip. You can go to the TV section, just click on that, and you can see all 150 shows that we've made over the years. Uh, if you're thinking about Scandinavia, you click right there. One, two, three, four, five, six shows, three hours of TV on Scandinavia. If you're thinking about Portugal, you got three shows. If you're thinking about Italy, oh, oh you got 18 shows. And you've even got all of our specials. We've done hours and hours of specials and all of them are available all the time for free, just a click away. If you want to see any of our shows, that's where you can go. Also, when you look at our, um, when you look at the website, you can click on Festival of Europe and you can see the shows that we have uh, done in the last few days. And they are, you may have missed them, but you can watch them on uh, video and all of them are recorded. So uh, this show will be recorded and uh, in one or two days, it'll be up there. And you can also see upcoming shows and just a click away, you can register for those shows. So there is plenty of information at our website. I also want to remind you, we've got our tour program. And if you click on tours, uh, you can see a lot of information about our tours probably of interest right now is you look on the left here and you see all the different destinations and if you click on that we click on scandinavia and you can see these are the 2023 tours of scandinavia drill down into this hit days and prices and what we got here is a situation where we must have 20 departures to scandinavia and all of them except one are sold out these are all join the waitlist join the waitlist I noticed except for the very first one, June 20th, still has seats on it. But I do want to remind you, if you've come up with a date and it says join the wait list, by all means, join the wait list because people come and people go. Uh, we sometimes have a lot of people on the wait list and we are able to add another departure and you'll be the first to know about that. And of course, we're doing the same thing again next year. So lots of information for our tours when you go to ricksteves.com. All right. Now, what I'd like to do is, what would I like to do? I'd like to come back and um, finish off with our PowerPoint here and remind people that um, 
uh, a tour, a Rick Steves tour, is uh, it's important to know what is included when you're shopping around. I'm just very thankful that we offer all of the group sightseeing at no extra cost. Most tour companies charge extra for their sightseeing. We include it. Uh, we have small groups, uh, 24 to 28 people on a 50 seat bus. Everybody gets a couple of seats. The full-time services of a professional Rick Steves guide like PAL, all group transportation, all accommodations, and so on. You can read it right there. Um, also remember, we're going to be uh, raffling off, or, or just not raffling off, we're going to just have a contest, a drawing, where we're going to give away some free tours. You'll get an email tomorrow. After 24 hours, you'll get an email, and it'll explain to you with a link how you can put your name in the bucket for the tour, and who knows, you might win a tour to Europe. Also remember, if you're curious about any of our tours, uh, if you sign up this month, you get 100 bucks off. And tomorrow, we're going to Switzerland. I can hardly wait. 24 hours from now, we're going to join up. Right now, 6 o'clock uh, Seattle time, 9 o'clock on the East Coast, and we'll be traveling through Switzerland. We got every night till the end of the month a party, a travel party, as together we celebrate our love of Europe. Hey, pal, thank you oh. so much for being with us. <laughs> Skull to you. It's called and, Rick. And Gabe. Pleasure I bet to we be on the show. What's that now, pal? It's a pleasure to be on the show. It's a pleasure for you to wake up at three o'clock in the morning and be with us. <laughs> and, I, hey, and I know there's a lot of people I know they're watching. And I just want to say hi, hi to all of them. They know who they are. I also want to send a greeting to Skip and Michael, which went on a local guide tour with me the other day in Oslo. Oh, fantastic. I want to remind everybody that we're wearing our t-shirts, our keep on traveling t-shirts. You got yours on there, pal? It's here. There you go. <laughs> keep on <laughs> traveling, buddy. We're back in the saddle. It's so good to be traveling on. Hey, Gabe, I think we have a few minutes for some questions. Do you have any questions for pal? We do. We have a lot of wonderful questions. Um, Pal, being a Scandinavian tour guide, I'm sure that you are used to answering this one. But I'm going to yeah, finally but... eat my open face sandwiches. I haven't even had a <laughs> chance to dig into these. So, pal, it's all yours, baby. <laughs> Deborah and many others are wondering, what are the best strategies for trying to see the Northern Lights? Well, the best strategy is um, to go during the winter time um you know that's when when it's the biggest chance of seeing it during december well november december january february and also make sure that you stay for some days not just go one day or even two days up north you want to have a few days so because it might be overcast when you get there and then but then next day you might get lucky again it's a big deal in iceland everybody goes to iceland to see the northern lights and i think what paul is getting at is it's a big investment of time and your vacation is really precious and you might have to wait several days to see those flickering lights in the sky. In Reykjavik, capital of Iceland, I recommend people go to the museum about the Northern Lights and, and see it on a big screen and save yourself all the time because there's so many other things to do with your precious vacation time. But that's just me. <laughs> Uh, another question is from Teresa and wondering, um, does Norway offer any good scenic train routes that people can explore? Oh, they have plenty. There's uh, there's several good uh, good scenic train routes. And perhaps the most famous one is the one that goes from Oslo to Bergen, uh, which takes you over the um, Hardanger uh, mountain plateau. Um, so that one's very, very popular. Uh, but there are other, also other ones um, going up up north to on the Raumabane, Rauma for instance. Um, so there's a lot of them. But the one to Bergen is the one that's most popular. Hey, Paul, if you're just an insane tourist that just wants to see too much with the limited amount of time, we Americans have the shortest vacations in the rich world, you know. Um, you could take the train in the morning out of Oslo, do all that beautiful fjord country stuff, um, take a little boat ride, and you could spend a couple of hours in Bergen in the evening and then catch the overnight train back to Oslo. And 24 hours after you left, you could be back home in Oslo, right? Yeah, that's right. You can do all that in a day. It's uh, called Norway in a nutshell. <laughs> I've done it. I love it. <laughs> I actually went for one of our staff Halloweens as Norway in a nutshell before. So as a, yeah. my costume. You'd um, <laughs> Tell me the costume. Part. Dave, what was the costume? That's interesting. I had a I had a Norway flag t-shirt and a Viking helmet, and then I like used cardboard to fashion a peanut shell that I put over. <laughs> so, 
Good man. <laughs> it's going to be my dress this year. There you go. You can you have permission to steal. Anybody on this call has permission to steal it. Um, Paul, Kathy is wondering which of the Scandinavian countries are in the EU and the Schengen zone? So all the Scandinavian countries are in the Schengen zone. Uh, but only Denmark and Sweden is in the union. Norway is not in the union. We voted no to that back in uh, 1994. Why is Norway holding out? Uh, I mean, there, there are many different reasons for that. Uh, you know, we broke out of the union with the Swedes back in 1905. So maybe we're not so ready to enter into another union. Uh, we also have a lot of natural resources, fish and oil and so on. And we want to sort of keep the control ourselves, you know, set our own quotas for, for the fishing industry and so on. So that that's that's also part of it. And um, yeah. You no, know, that's, that's just a practical reality. In the EU, people give, people who have more, give more. People who need more, take more. And Norway, understandably, is thinking, hey, we've got more to gain by staying out of it, probably. Yeah. But I have to just add that we, even though we're not members of the EU, we have a we have a trade deal with the EU. So so uh, we're like we tend to say that we're seventy five percent member and twenty five percent not. So we're very much an integrated part of the of the EU. And Roxanne is wondering. You you mentioned the vote in nineteen ninety four. Roxanne was wondering. In the Scandinavian countries, is civic engagement um, and like levels of voting fairly high? Yeah, it's fairly high. It's usually well over 70%. Oh, okay. in, I think in Sweden, even over 80% at many elections. So uh, it's, it's quite high. It's something that everybody does. You know, like here in the US, we, we struggle to make it over about 50, 50 or 60%. So, mm -hmm. um, Susan had a question that I really liked. She asked, um, we talked about people in Scandinavia being some of the happiest in the world. You specifically said Denmark. Um, what do the happiest people in the world complain about? <laughs> we complain about the weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's something we complain about. Uh, you know, no, I, I mean... I think a lot of our 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 problems up here they become small compared to many other other countries. Um, so I try to complain as little as um, as possible. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really want to point out any any special things that we complain much about. Paul, we have time for one more question tonight, um, and that question comes from Cheryl. And Cheryl would like to know, I know last night we were um, exploring Spain with Federico and he talked about just going up to Spaniards in the street and you could just interrupt their meal and chat with them. I know that sometimes the stereotype of Scandinavians is that they can be a bit more reserved, but what are good strategies for connecting with locals um, and really getting to know people in Scandinavia? Yeah, it's right. We can seem a bit shy and a bit reserved, but we're actually quite social people. We like, I mean, we like to chat with others. We like to talk to, to strangers. Um, so, I mean, an another advantage in Scandinavia is that everybody speaks English. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's fairly easy, but if you want to break the ice with the Scandinavian, you can just talk about the weather, uh, for instance. That's always a good strategy. <laughs> And you can bet any Scandinavian you want to talk to, they speak English. I mean, it's yeah. just, if you're educated, you speak English in Scandinavia. Because think about it, 5 million people speak Norwegian. If that's all you spoke, your world would be very small. Yeah. And also, also Scandinavians in general are very curious about Americans. You know, we, we know a lot about your culture, uh, your popular culture, your politics, and so on. Uh, yeah. So we're, we're interested in, in talking with, with the Americans also. You know, I went to a party with my cousin in Oslo, who's a publisher in Oslo, and um, I've known her since I was a little kid. And I just went, she was having a party at her house, and she's quite a social person, and she's connected with a lot of people in publishing. Everybody was there. It was a classic Norwegian scene. And then she just went, you know, cling, cling, cling. Uh, excuse me, uh, my cousin from Seattle is here, so everybody will speak English tonight. 
<laughs> so I could be part of the party. And it was yeah. like, no big deal. It was just like, change it over to English. Great. And it was such a wonderful time to meet a lot of people that care about the world, that love their heritage, that, that speak English. Um, it's just a beautiful place socially. And I think you can assume, as Pal said, that people are interested in Americans. They're curious about America. They've got relatives in America. They speak English. They're curious. They're, they're just open-minded and they like to get into meaningful conversations. I love to talk politics with Norwegians and Scandinavians. Yeah. If you go to a, a dinner party in Scandinavia, you can be sure to talk about uh, religion and politics. <laughs> All right. Pal, here's to religion and politics and good <laughs> travels. Cool. I am so thankful for that, for your um, partnership, the beautiful tour guiding you do, and for you, you to wake up in the middle of the night and uh, spend a little time with us and uh, celebrate your beautiful corner of Europe. So thanks, Paul. I'll see you in Oslo, God willing. And to everybody who joined thank us you. tonight, thank you again, Paul. And thank you for joining us on our January European Travel Festival. Happy travels. Good night, Paul. Good night. Good night, Gabe. Good night, Rick. Good night, Paul. Good night, everybody, and we hope to see you in Switzerland tomorrow.